Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, it is a, a privilege, a pleasure uh, once again to be on the Solutions Podcast, to hate or not to hate. We all know the answer to that. Uh, but we are in uh, the investigative research lab of the ADL and with my partner and friend and CEO of the ADL. True. Jonathan Greenblatt. My brother, how you doing? I'm great and better now that we're going to have such a great conversation. Yes, a great conversation indeed because uh, joining us today is someone who has an illustrious career in media uh, and uh, one of the voices of New York. Uh, and also, I mean, as we'll get in, get the, the long career mm -hmm. list of, you know, actually spanning the entire country uh, from San Diego, my hometown, uh, but also in many other areas hailing from Houston, Texas, I believe. Uh, H-Town. <laughs> uh, one of the strong voices in radio uh, and media, like the one and only Michelle Way. Yes. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. How welcome. You doing? Yeah, thank you. And thank you guys for having me. I'm doing well. What about you guys? No, I mean, we woke up this morning, so it's a good start. <laughs> That's yeah. Yeah. Uh, but again, we like to dive right in in these conversations. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously being here in the investigative research lab welcome but this is clearly as you see this is like central intelligence i know uh to get rid of hate yeah. <laughs> yeah. and that's ultimately what our discussions are on this podcast um and a lot of people think because of you know jonathan and i's background that they think it's all conversation about black and jewish relations mm -hmm. which that is important to, mm -hmm. to both of us but it's like you know defamation of all kinds yeah. you know yeah. er erasing hate of, of all kind is, is really the ADL's mission and even I would say my personal mission mm -hmm. because yes. you know when you can educate you can eradicate hate uh, and it, it's as simple as that so we usually like to start these conversations off because obviously you you're you're a professional in your space been doing this for so long but we want to even know you know the the little girl Shelly like, mm -hmm. uh, and being a black woman just in general as I say is the most disrespected, underappreciated, uh, and discredited individual on the planet. So, uh, but <laughs> the most resilient, yes. strong, strong, yes. powerful, but even, and we'll get into this too, because even sometimes those terms can be used against you and weaponized yeah. as yeah. being a strong black woman. Angry. Yeah, they yeah. start using angry, uh, or even yeah. just the strength of it's like, why do you have to be so aggressive? But we'll get into all of that. Yeah. Um, and then the whole, and, and not to interrupt you, but you know, if you are jovial, it's like, wait a minute, you're supposed to be angry. You're supposed to be angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, but I know I have several questions for you, but I, I want to start with the, the first uh, question is, please tell us about your first time that you experienced discrimination or that you experienced bigotry or hate that you can remember. <sighs> I, it, it's so interesting that I remember it clearly, and wow. it was so long ago. Um, as soon as you asked me, I didn't have to think, wait, let me think. It was, it's right there. Mm. Um, I was a kid, I don't know, maybe 9, 10, 11, something, somewhere around there. Um, we, Astroworld, you've heard In of Houston. it. Yeah, Houston. Yeah, it was our Disney world, our yeah. Disneyland, our great adventure, all that yeah. stuff. Um, and you know, Travis Scott did the whole album about it. Yeah, right, right. Um, Astro World was, it's our heart. We reminisce about it all the time. And I remember we were waiting in line for um, the Texas Cyclone, which is our big wooden roller coaster. Um, and um, you know, sometimes you can wait in line at the roller, you know, at, at the roller coaster and everyone's not even, you know? And we saw a guy who wanted to ride with his friends, but there were two of them. Um, and then he was alone. Mm. And so he was behind us though. And I remember saying to him, um, he was white by the way. And I remember saying to him, you can go ahead of me so you can ride with your friends. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, I don't wanna go in front of you, you know? Mm. And although he didn't say anything about race, you knew exactly mm. what he meant. Wow. Um, he didn't wanna, go in front of me. He didn't want to have any kind of react interaction, excuse me, with me. Yeah, he wow. didn't want because you was, doing something nice for him. To yeah, <laughs> to you, wow. it was about race without even being spoken. And you know? coming from Texas, I mean, a lot of stuff is probably about race. How old were you when that was? About 9, 10, 11, somewhere around there. And yeah. so wow. in, in, in your 9, 
10 year old mind did did you just wonder why this kid was being so mean I to felt, you or did I think you it immediately made me feel really bad wow. it didn't make me feel bad about myself you know right. that's one um one thing that i've noticed about myself you know growing up is most of the time people bullies um, people who do mean things to mm -hmm. you, their intention is to make you feel bad about yourself. Mm -hmm. Somehow, I have never fallen, you know, um, prey to that, but I did feel bad because I'm just one of those people that I just love everyone. Right. I'm just, I love everyone, right. and so I immediately felt really bad and sad about it, and wow. then it, it, I never forgot it. And I mean, because when you think, I'm just keep it a stack, when you think Texas, you think like it's just, you know, a hotbed for racism because uh, just the way we perceived yeah. a yeah, lot well, of Yeah, well, listen. Um, but well, was it, because that, I mean, that doesn't even seem overt, you know what I mean? Like where there's some things where, you know, you hear people the first time can remember when they were called the N-word is or, you know, actually said, you know, black people can't do this or that. To me, this seems like it was, it two, was two children that, you know, for whatever preconceived notion, he didn't yeah. want anything yeah. from he you. He was a little older than I was. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, but he was a teenager. But, you know, um, I don't know. You, I can't say, you know, I went to predominantly black schools. I went to, um, you know, I, my neighborhood was predominantly black. Right. Um, so I didn't um, get a lot of, you know, people calling me the N-word, you know, growing up. Right. But uh, to your point about Texas, both my parents... Mm -hmm. Um, who are from Texas. My dad grew up on a farm in East Texas, a um, few hours outside of Dallas. My mom grew up in Houston. Um, I am the first generation, my siblings and I are the first generation um, of black people in Texas who didn't have to ride in the back of the bus, who had full rights. Wow. Um, you know, just before I was born, you know, we, you know, we, um, segregation was ended. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, um, I didn't have to experience, um, you know, of course you experience, you know, um, bigotry and such, but not in the same way that my parents experienced it. Right. Um, you know, where they had to go, you know, the high school I attended and my siblings attended, it's a historically black high school in Houston, Jack Gates High School. Um, same high school that George Floyd attended, same high school Debbie mm. Allen and Felicia Rashad attended. Um, it's a historically black um, high school it was at the time when my mom grew up, one of only three um, high schools that black people could attend in wow. Houston. Wow, it's so funny. Cause um, so high schools were segregated. Yeah. High school, oh yes, well, everything just was. Just a generation before yours. Every, wow. my parents could not, they, they could not. My mom, when she was a teenager, um, was uh, detained. I don't know if arrested is the right word because she wouldn't give up her seat on a bus for a white man. Wow. Because she was a little black girl. Wow. She was a little black girl, and he wanted her to give up his seat, her seat for him. But it's Crazy. funny that, that then your experience is, you know, a generation later. Yeah. So you were actually trying to do for another race, right. and he didn't want to have anything to do. Yeah, and, and, and also, I, you know, because I know what my parents experienced, um, I feel like it's, 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 it's my duty to go after my dreams, because they they had times in their lives where they couldn't dream. Yeah. At least they felt like they couldn't right. dream to aspire to reach certain goals because it just wasn't within their rights, you Charlie, know? that's so powerful. And so for me, I, that's why I think that's why I'm so goal driven because right. I feel like I can achieve this. My parents um, sacrificed a lot. They worked really hard and they went through this. They weren't able to do the same things that I can do, you well, know? Clearly, I mean, you're living your dream. <laughs> you're making your parents proud, I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, here in New York, they can hear you on 94.7 The Block mm -hmm. every day in the afternoon now. But so I want to talk about your professional career mm -hmm. for uh, a second, because, I mean, you've you've been a dominant voice for so long. But even specifically, let's talk about your voice for a second. Uh -huh. And I would love to enter the, the conversation of the concepts of talking black mm -hmm. <laughs> or talking mm -hmm. white, because what I always found remarkable, and even I feel like I, I heard your, your voice, you know, before I saw your face. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, you know, you're the first African-American to ever host a full-time show on Z100. Z100, uh, yeah. New York. You know Z100. 100%. It's the biggest pop station in the, in the world, actually. And one wouldn't necessarily know 
that you were a black woman mm -hmm. by just hearing you. Uh, and there, there's some caveats, some pros and cons to this. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear your concept, or, I mean, your, your, your understanding and even how, knowing coming from H-Town, uh -huh. knowing when you could throw on the jargon at any point if you wanted to, but then also knowing there's probably a mainstream sonic <laughs> uh, uh, approach that one, yeah. even when... Speaking as a journalist. Uh, yeah, uh, I gotta say something. Like, I, when talking while black, I'd like to understand this because mm -hmm. you know, my first thought is you don't sound Texan to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? I get that that's a lot. what I, I thought that, yeah. when I read And your that's bio. even probably but what I'm saying more to where I'm pretty sure when she get around her family or when Real she country. Want, real yeah, country. Yeah, she, she can let that out. But in a professional setting, right. especially knowing, you know, on a, in a space like Z100, mm -hmm. one, is that just something that you naturally say, I'm gonna do this, or is that, have you been told, like, lose the no accent? No one trained or, me or yeah. anything. I mean, I did study radio and TV in, in high school and college, actually. Um, Cause you have the, that, you do have that sound, that totally. journalist reporter, <laughs> that you, it sounds professional if I was gonna yeah. give it a definition yeah. that wasn't a stereotypical bigoted idea. I'd say you talk professionally. Yeah, and I, I think, um, I feel like that's natural, but at the same time, I, I did study speech and such in, you know, mm. when I studied radio and television, so that may have a lot more to do with it than, you know, I give, give it credit for, you know. Um, but uh, again, I grew up singing and performing, and so you kind of like, when you, when you sing, you feel like, you know, you have, I, I know for me, you know, you're trained, you're in, 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 Mrs. Butler's choir class, and she's like, right. sit straight up, <laughs> yeah. and you do this, oh. yes. <laughs> Speak and from, from the diaphragm. From the diaphragm, <laughs> and so you just kind of, you know, get a little proper like, you know? Yeah. And so I think I, it always, um, for me, it went hand in hand. I never said, I'm gonna talk like a journalist. <laughs> right, right. I never said that, um, nor did I ever say, I'm gonna talk like I'm white. I never, yeah. you know, I feel like I'm talking like I'm Shelly. Mm. But, you know, other people I have been, I, I have been viciously picked on for, for speaking the way I speak. Really? Yeah. Like, tell me about that. And, like, and mostly for, about, from black people, from, for why sure. Why are you talking all white? <laughs> Shelly, you know where you're from, Shelly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I get that all the time. Really? I remember one time when I was on air in Houston, I worked at a hip hop station then. Um, and again, I never really felt like I had to speak a certain way for anyone. I feel like I'm being me. And so if I'm on the hip hop station, I don't feel like I have to be like, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> I'm speaking just the way I speak yeah. on the hip hop station and, and people loved me. Yeah. You know, they, they, they supported me. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> I remember going out to do a live broadcast and listeners were showing up and, you know, saying hi, meeting me. And I remember there was this one guy who showed up and he said, listen to how you talk. You're talking like you're white, you know? And he, it was almost like he was attacking me. Wow. And it was like really odd. I'm like, well, this is all love. Why is he coming at me <laughs> like this? What's going on? You know, why is he being, what's all this vitriol, hmm. you know? And uh, so much so that the rest of the listeners started attacking him, not <laughs> physically, but like you leaving leave her Shelley alone. Exactly. <laughs> Let Shelly talk like Shelly. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So yes, I've, I've received that for so sure. So interesting, and even one of the reasons why I wanted to open up the conversation, because mm -hmm. I get it quite a bit, mm -hmm. but I get it on like, they I almost feel like I'm trying to assimilate, because mm -hmm. they say the, the Nick Cannon on Wildin' Out is different from the Nick Cannon on Mass Singer, or, or even America's Got Talent, which rightly so, it, I have to say it is because I understand my demographics. Also, yes. the, the Nick Cannon on Nickelodeon is quite different from the Nick Cannon yeah. that's on BET or hip hop radio because I know my audience, I'm not going to be cursing, you know, when yeah. I'm talking to children. You uh, know your trade yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know the different genres of things that but you're doing. But all of those are me. Yeah, like exactly. No, you know, like because you're multifaceted. Right, right. You're but not you just like. Me, but you remind, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you remind me of that Key and Peele skit. You know, they came <laughs> yeah, skin, exactly. where it's like there's a way they talk around the white people, yeah. there's a way they talk and then together. Code switching is Co what they call yeah. it, yeah. And I mean, code switching is a real thing, And but should one 
be praised for it or should be one criticized for it because it's a real thing. Do you feel like you're code switch idol? Yes. <laughs> like I am different right. around white people <laughs> than when I'm around black people. Right. But it's interesting because then it starts to comply whether in one nor the other, but it's like I like to be in spaces where I can be my best self. Mm -hmm. Right. And sometimes my best self is amongst my people. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, because I get to speak truthfully right and, and I'm more comfortable mm -hmm. but then sometimes my best spaces if it's a professional setting or other areas are like okay when I'm in a professional setting that that's a different approach the the people the people we are when we're at home with our families and the things that we say there is different than who we are at work and, yeah. and you know who we, who will be at synagogue or church like yeah. when we go to church we on our best behavior you you better not say this you better not do right. that it's certain there's certain codes and 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 rules that we abide by yeah. in certain settings so it's real and, yeah. and i i'm a proud believer in you know you got to be your authentic self mm -hmm. but you also have to assimilate to make sure you're making everyone else comfortable because mm -hmm. we all know we've been around those people who are too loud in church <laughs> or at work and they use an inappropriate language and it's like right. yo you gotta have some you gotta have social cues are real mm -hmm. right you know and i feel like sometimes god bless those people who right. don't have like just they're they them, can be they're that, that one person, person. All, and i'm but those are the people like oh this is probably you probably shouldn't be break dancing in walgreens <laughs> The hell, <laughs> Twer twerking in Whole Foods is not really twerking at the salad bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are proper twerking places. <laughs> right. and the, the, yeah, Whole Foods is not the place. But <laughs> the, you know, so to God bless all the people that yeah. are just one way, you know, all the time. But I am one of those people that like I understand my surroundings. Yeah, I mean, to your point, of course, you know, I I, I grew up in in you know mostly black environments, and so I feel completely comfortable and myself in those environments. And if I'm uh, outside of that environment, there have been time, that environment, excuse me, there have been times where I feel like, oh, people are watching me. So you feel like you have to be more formal. Right. So I agree with you, yeah. And so I would ask the question because as we, I mean, as I talked about it, I mean, like even from the perspective of a black woman, we, we really want to hear more and understand more. Yeah. Um, Knowing what, whether it's Z100 or what, I, I mean, you, you've worked at many states. I know you uh, were a strong black voice in, in the San Diego community. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us like the first time you experienced discrimination in a professional setting, especially knowing that being a black woman in journalism uh, in a, a responsible voice, when did you say, wow, I'm, I'm a, I'm rare, you know, and I'm important because of what I'm experiencing. Like most people haven't even interacted with a black woman in these settings. Yeah, I have to say, sadly enough, the first time I experienced discrimination in the workplace, I was still a college student when I first got my uh, full time job on the radio. Mm. I was still in college. I went to uh, an HBCU, um, um, Texas Southern in Houston. Southern. Um, <laughs> And sadly enough, uh, it was from a black man. Mm. One of my coworkers um, at the station was joking. I had um, my boss was white, the program director was white, and our promotions director was white. And this coworker was someone who was behind the scenes, wasn't on air. And I walked in again, college student. I'm, you know, I'm like uh, not really um, jaded about anything. I'm hopeful, and you know. <laughs> And I'm learning. This is my first full-time job on the radio, right. so I'm learning. And I, I walk in, and it, it kind of makes me cry thinking about it, actually, mm. because specifically because it was a black man. I walk in, and they didn't see me, but he was joking with my bosses about how dark I was. Really? He was joking with my two white bosses about me being dark-skinned. It makes me want to cry thinking about it. Did he know you were there? He didn't know. They didn't know I, w I was uh, there in the doorway. Because wow. they were joking and talking, and he, they weren't joking about my skin color. He was. He was dancing wow. and, and, and tapping for them. Yeah, I mean, lousy. but no, that's how he really felt. Really? You know what I'm saying? That's wow. how he really felt. 
Um, and um, he was a guy, and, and again, this is not to say anything, but he didn't date black women. Um, and that's how he really felt about my skin color. And so he chose to, to joke about it with my bosses when they weren't, again, I came in the conversation, they weren't even talking about my skin color. Wow. He was the one who brought it up. Wow. And it's, it was very hurtful and yeah. I never forgot it. And he's, you know, friends with me on Facebook and he'll be like liking comments. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. What but if he even remembers that? I would love. I mean, cause, wow. I mean, because even it's funny. I mean, I, in the in the comments and all those things, I often uh, am a part of the the colorism conversation mm -hmm. because the complexion of you know the mothers of my children mm -hmm. or even the perception of that. And I was excited to see, I can't remember her name, but she was like dark skin. I was like, Nick likes a dark skin see? girl, what? <laughs> <laughs> so Shelly has been a part of this conversation. Shelly well. understands. But no, no, but let's talk about that because okay. that's a real thing. And even in, you know, who we date and what we prefer. Mm -hmm. I personally, I like them all. Like it's, <laughs> it's been clear, I got a, a nice assortment. <laughs> but even in that conversation, uh -huh. people think that I may treat you know, the, my, my dark skin child or the dark skin mother Different. child, differently. Because like, I just read a comment, they were like, he forgot that the baby's the name. One name the one name that I forgot <laughs> happened to be the, the darker complexed child. I'm like, oh, that <laughs> devil is busy. Like, <laughs> like, like, first of all, I'll be forgetting my, all my kids' names all the time. You better work on that. Yeah, I you got to keep a list. I'm going to forget some you of them. Pull out. But even, my, my, you know, uh, and blessings and love and I mean, because I do understand. Mm -hmm. So as much as, you know, I understand how difficult, uh, you know, actually I don't understand mm -hmm. because I am not a black woman, but I understand the social construct of, you know, complexionism and colorism and knowing that I am, you know, the, the father of a chocolate girl, mm -hmm. a, uh, an amazing, gorgeous, beautiful chocolate girl, but I'm gonna have to give her more attention Mm -hmm. in certain spaces and not forget her name and, and mm -hmm. things like, because it's already a sensitive matter yeah, uh, to to a young black girl that's going to be looked upon differently even in the space of dating to because for whatever reason I mean there's multiple reasons we know the understanding but you know in America specifically that you know the darker you are the less attractive you mm -hmm. appear and you're saying like your co-worker says he doesn't date you know it, date dark-skinned women or black women in general mm -hmm. but like i'll it, it's such a complex conversation because i almost have to like have to run down my track record of, uh, to prove right. i do love black women right. what about her what about her right. and like and then it even gets to that space of what is black mm -hmm. because a lot of times people have want to discredit you know my my ex-wife, you know, Mariah Carey because said she, she's not black. But like, yeah. All right, well, if she's not black, then is Bar Barack Obama not black? Yeah. You know, is Bob Marley not black? Right. Like, well, people want uh, people who are interracial and who have, you know, two different races, they want them to choose one. Pick a race. Right. Pick right. a race. Yeah. You know? And that, ha I mean, I couldn't imagine having to do that. But yeah. then, so how, I mean, how important is that in the in the conversation of, of colorism and, and having self-esteem and dealing with like the discrimination. It's of been being the story of my life. I mean, and again, I never really had the sense that being dark skinned was bad. I never thought that. Yeah. Although that's what people consistently want to, you know. Um, well, I think because you I, come from a community where black is embraced and black is beautiful. I mean, yeah, Houston is probably one of the most yeah, pro-black, strong, you know, communities. It is. Even, especially, like, knowing that it's surrounded by, you know, old school Texas mentality sometimes. It is. Um, you feel very loved as a black person in Houston, for <laughs> yeah. sure. But my whole life, you know, high school, I, my one of my best friends, um, I have uh, two best friends, they're sisters. One is kind of my skin color and the other is super light. They have the same parents, but just different colors. Oh, wow. And it did, and, but whenever a guy would like me, oh my God, oh my God, I love you. Then he would meet my best friend. He's like, whoa, she's light skin. He liked her because oh, she was light right? skin. Yes. Yeah. And then 
even more so, even if they would meet my best friend who was my skin color, she had curly hair. Uh -huh. So that was even better because it was less black. You because know that's what colorism doesn't so just have to do with complexion. It's all it has different hair kinds texture, of things. Yeah. Features. It's all different. Yes. So so the less black you seem to them, you know, the, you know what I'm saying? And it's not, I'm not saying that's everyone, but just it, it's just what I grew up with. But Shirley, that, just that, to um, clarify, is that among other black people? Yes, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah, colorism is, all, yes. is mostly amongst it's, black people yes. and complexion. I, sorry, I didn't specify that. Yeah. But yes, growing up in, you know, going to a black high Light school. Light skin is then, better in, in oh, see, that's going to yes. be the clip they take. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> actually say, you it's, per, yeah, up the it's earth perceived yes. right. that light skin is, and it, it really is, it's a European influence. Because, I mean, if you think about even the same thing of what you experienced, sure. to where blonde hair, blue eyes, thin lips, mm -hmm. small nose, is, appeared to be more attractive, and that's, generations of everyone's trying to assimilate to that look yeah. so you know uh, a, a beautiful African woman is probably the exact opposite of all of those things. Well, yeah. then you think about it, you know, like that's why they say representation matters, right? Yes. Because you would, all you would see on TV were white people mm, and magazine and covers. Your yeah. your dolls, Barbies, Jesus. were the most beautiful dolls. <laughs> yes, yeah. Barbies were the most beautiful yeah. dolls, and they had, you know, blonde, a certain hair, shape, yeah, blonde, yeah, and you know, yeah. and so that's what people then, you know, it's almost like you're promoting, this is how you're supposed to look, this is how you're, you know, and then so people grow up, generations of people are growing up thinking that. I, I don't know how I, I got past that. I never really felt. Yeah, because you seem like you love yourself. You embrace it. I mean, listen, are. I have issues for sure. <laughs> but well, we don't, but, but you, you hide them well. Yeah. Because but I've never even thought you, that. Yeah you know, that there was something wrong with me because I was dark skinned. I never thought that, you know? Right. I just always thought, what is wrong, wrong with people, you yeah, know? Yeah. I mean, but even still today, you, you, you go on a, um, you get um, the polls that say dating sites, black women are the lowest on the totem pole. Nobody's gonna choose us on dating sites. It's yeah, like, really? oh my God, what is the, because I'm single, so I, I, I think about those kinds of things. Um, so it's still a thing, but wow. There's like black women and Asian men. Are the those are the, yeah. I was like, y'all should just get but together. The, the Asian men rate, the Asian men rate. Right, the, for, for men, they're at the, really? On the, yeah, yeah, on the dating sites. But the thing about wow. it is, is that it's getting better. Yes. Right. You know, representation, you see more, more diverse people on, you know, in commercials and in movies and, yeah. you know, I mean, still, still not the rap videos, yeah. but. Uh, <laughs> I think she's shooting at me right now. <laughs> She's doing. Uh, no, right. okay, so let me flip it real quick and then ask you this question. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to, you, you, you said you, you're dating, you're on the site, does uh, complexion or even race matter to Shelly Way when the person that she wants to, to uh, date or even start a, a future or a family with? Because then I, I, I want to pose a question to you too, Jonathan, is where, what we see, and it's all, it's interesting because depending on the ethnic group, um, it's appeared to be Jewish people like to date and mate with Jewish people. Um, in the black culture, mm -hmm. it's almost looked down upon to date outside your race, where I feel like there's a common idea of loving one's culture enough to preserve it. So when we hear the ideas of some white supremacists and even alt-right and extremists in that space, they say, I just want to, I want white people to date white people because we're trying to preserve the white race. That sounds heavy and racist when a white person says it, mm -hmm. but when a black person or even a Jewish person says it, it's more understood or even easily digestible. So one, I would love for you to answer, I just want to know, you know, I'll get all in your business for a second, <laughs> but then, you know, sure. maybe even some concepts of why do you think that sure. is in our culture? Well, I think, you know, I don't want to speak for all black people, but I feel like... No, you have so to speak for all <laughs> black people. That's the, uh, you I, have to on I this feel, show. I feel like <laughs> more so in the black community as opposed to, you know, being a purist. I think it's um, people often feel like either you're selling out or you're rejecting who we are because so often people would assimilate or, or 
What Trust are they, me, I get it every the, day on Twitter. What's yeah. the uh, the word uh, passing? Yeah, yeah. People yeah. back in the day, if they were light enough, they would pass for white so and that they Jewish, could get Jewish. They right? do it every day. Yeah. You know that passing concept and to so, to, uh, yeah. to avoid being persecuted. Yeah. And so I think more so in the black community, it's not not so much about uh, s- preservation of the race as it is. You're not um, proud of who is, you are. Yes, what you are, you're rejecting who we are. I think that's, it is I about think preservation now. But it could be, too. Yeah, maybe, in, I'm not saying it can't be, yeah, but before, yes. Before, I don't think generations cared. It was more about the passing yeah. thing. But now, yeah. because, as Dave Chappelle says, you know, soon all of us going to be beige. You know <laughs> what I mean? Because, which is the idea of a melting pot and everyone coming yeah. together. But now what we have done it, is you have desegregated the human race, mm-hmm. which some people don't want, in which I understand. You want, you right. know, people of African heritage to, to hold true to that. You want people of Italian heritage mm-hmm. to hold true to that. Uh, whatever the background is, but there's this, you know, even this, sometimes people even call it a, a, a socialist concept of just everybody being equal in one thing. Mm-hmm. and. And, you know, we kind of have to embrace our differences. So I understand when cultures want to, especially if there's only six million mm-hmm. uh, or six, how many, 16? Uh, the, around the, uh, the world? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, 15 million. 15 Jews. million Jewish people wow, okay. on the planet. Oh, wow, okay. You know, I understand in the same the sense. It's almost a self-preservation yeah. and endangered yeah. species, even as we look as black men only being, or black people only being 13% of the population mm-hmm. of, you know, America. Everybody wants as many of us as possible. So is that uh, something? Look, I think to put this in some context. So, you know, white supremacy is a real thing, mm-hmm. as in there are prevailing systems that exist here for a long time that privilege, I don't want to say white presenting, they, they privilege white people. And there's a hierarchy. Mm-hmm. And the hierarchy, you know, Isabel Wilkerson calls it caste. There's a hierarchy in, in, the, in the American kind of um, mythology, right. black people are the bo- have been historically the bottom of the hierarchy, right? Uh, and so I think white supremacy is a set of sort of values and infrastructure, yeah, that <laughs> are encoded into these systems yeah. that often might not be explicit, but they're implicit and they're there. So again, like, when looking at resumes, the person with a, if you a black sounding name, yeah. or who goes to the HBCU, mm-hmm. might not even get asked for the interview. And we know this with Unless mortgage. Unless they gotta check a box and they need that person. Well, there's th- that <laughs> different thing. But like, we know this is also true with respect to like, people applying for mortgages and so on and, and so forth. Um, the valuation of homes. Oh, it totally, there was yeah. just an article yeah, they, the Yeah, that Times. was amazing mm-hmm. that we're like. Unbelievable. I, I, I've dealt with the, uh, real estate quite a bit and mm-hmm. it's like, you almost, you don't want them, like your house is lesser valued if it's lived in by yeah. a black person. That's take all the black say. art out yeah, while take, they come yeah, in. They yeah. Take the black yeah. out. Yeah. I like this, it's kind of like a cultural redlining of sorts. Now, so those things are real, number one. There's also, there's something very different which is white nationalism. This idea that you be nationalistic and pride in being white. White pride. The challenge with that is when it comes at the expense of everyone else. Right. right. So typically white nationalism in the United States has been we want to separate from the lesser mongrel, you know, whatever races, which typically includes black people and Jewish people are in front of that line for them. So the white nationalism is an ideology of exclusion. Not really, even though they may in a performative way say it's about preserving our heritage, like the reality is in its manifestations, it's been it, that comes with, for example, racist literature and anti-Semitic ideas and so on and so forth. I, I think that is super different than the person who's ethnically Italian saying, I have a thousand years of history because my family is originally from, I don't know, Sicily. Mm-hmm. We want to preserve that. Yeah. And we, go to, we, we, we worship in a Catholic, Roman Catholic church, and we have a set of foods, and we have a set of cultural kind of in, uh, cultural informative things around us we want to maintain. I did, or when, if black folks are saying, you know, we have our own kind of domestic, almost indigenous culture that we've created over 400 years here, we want to maintain. 
I just think that's something very different. It's different, yeah. And and also, it, it, when you speak of, you know, we're saying black or African American, that's the whole reason they started saying African American, so that we would have a sense of we're from somewhere. Right. You know. Um, but even now, it's the conversation about ADOS. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because technically, What's that? well, because uh, technically, um, Barack Obama right. is not of the ADOS. Heritage because ADOS is uh, you know descendants of, of Sla African descendants of slaves. Or slaves. Or yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. uh, so you sure. know, so you he's know, not because he does his, his, yeah, his dad was directly from Kenya. Yeah. So then it's like oh he's not necessarily. Or you mentioned African. Bob Marley before, right? Yeah. Like there are people from the Cari no, but actually people who are in the Caribbean, uh, black folks. From yeah, the no, Caribbean, totally. But I would say Bob Marley there. because he is. Technically, I mean, I, I believe he's directly biracial in, in that sense to where he has, you know, if, if not his grandmother was white, it might even be his, I, I believe so, yeah, yeah, like his parent, you know, he's, he's mixed race. He's, uh, so, but no one ever really talks about that because he represents black culture and blackness in such a, 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 an intensive way. You know, like it's so strong when you hear his music and what he believes in. And just even Jamaican, you know yeah. what I mean? Like they, they don't get no blacker than Jamaican. Maybe Nigeria. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like like that just is just how you love yourself and yeah. embrace it. Yeah. Um, if your self love requires you to hate other people, mm. then it's not authentic. Right. That's and a great that, way yeah. to put it. If, if hate if if your love requires hate, then I think there's something yeah. intrinsically flawed and frankly dangerous. Yeah. It's so true, because yes, you should love yourself. Yeah, but 100%. It doesn't have to be at the expense of loving you know, the others. Yeah, hate, yeah, yeah. You know? So, I mean, again, because of where this conversation started, and I like how you haven't answered No, this, no, but. I was going to come back to it. <laughs> but like no, when I actually you, was going to come back to yeah, it, but yeah, we, yeah. you know, kind of like. No, no, but it's still, because obviously, and I'll just, just, you know, get into Jonathan's business a, a little bit, but like, his wife, uh, as they're both Jewish, but they're from two different types. Yeah, my wife's uh, from Iran, mm -hmm. yeah. and so Middle Eastern Jewish experience. And they've lived there. They say since the Babylonians ransacked or you know took over mm -hmm. Eretz Yisrael two, three thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. So they are. She's Iranian, ethnically, culturally, linguistically, everything, mm -hmm. uh, and even darker complected. Much, very more, well, very, very much so. Yeah, she doesn't look. White. So it's not Ashkenazi in right. that sense. Whereas like my family's from Germany and Hungary and these mm -hmm. are Jews who've lived or they're all gone now, but had lived there for a very long time. But like what we have in common is we're Jews. And so we pray the same way, we eat the same way, we have, you know, uh, in, in Hebrew a shared kind of language, a shared kind of cultural values. Mm -hmm. So for me, the fact that my wife is dark skinned or that her family speaks a different language at home than what I did doesn't matter because we're Jewish and that is the fundamental so that, That's so interesting in though lives. because you do have a common ground of 100%. being the same. 100%. But you're completely different. So, but it's But like, her experience as a Jewish woman of a Jewish family in Iran, mm -hmm. right, was about being second class citizens and being marginalized, institutionalized, I guess we call it anti-Semitism, right? right? Where Jews were fine in Iran as long as they kept their heads down, mm -hmm. kept their mouths shut, knew they couldn't work in a number of professions, knew they had to live over here. As long as you they did those things, knew that yeah. if, if, if a Muslim person was walking down the street, the Jewish person, the law was you had to get off the sidewalk, right. get out of the way. So as long as you understood your place, you're good. And so that's not that different than the experience of my forebearers mm -hmm. in Europe. Mm -hmm. right. So different cultural contexts, similar cultural experiences. Uh, so much to unpack there though, because I mean, obviously there's the similarities that you guys share together, but then there's the differences. Did you experience any like hatred or, or because you you married a yeah, Iranian woman, background. but then yeah. at the same time, like, oh no, at least she's J Jewish, so it's good. So my parents, when, when yeah, my parents, honestly, in their defense, they didn't go to college, and so mm -hmm. I was from to go to college, so they, were not all that worldly, let's say. They were born and raised in the same place and didn't travel that much or whatnot. And I say all that because when I said I had met this woman who was Iranian and Jewish, and I think I was in love with her, my parents said, well, how could she be Iranian and Jewish? Oh, wow. Like, I don't understand. Is she, she not a Muslim? Mm. No, she's not. No, I don't understand. Like, they couldn't even, the only Iranians they knew were the ones taking the hostages at the embassy. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, they didn't even have a, they didn't have a, 
point of reference. Right, right. But if she was Jewish, then it was okay. Right. So like yes. in our family, so that was what was important. Would you have ever married someone that wasn't Jewish? No. Okay. And that's the thing, like, and so I, that's why the understanding when someone like myself <laughs> is, is out there and those type of things don't matter to me. Mm -hmm. right. um, even within our culture, it's looked at as like, oh, here, and I'll put this layer on it because I do understand it, <laughs> is that when you see a successful black man, mm -hmm. you know, dating and mating mm -hmm. with uh, other races, mm -hmm. do you feel that that nature of like, oh, he, you know, as, as Kanye <laughs> once said uh, so eloquently, you know, uh, he, 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 he find himself a white girl, you know, in, um, when he becomes successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's also, it's funny because I was on a platform, one of my platforms, mm -hmm. like this, and having this conversation with uh, a friend who is uh, a, a member of the Nation of Islam, and I was playing the other side of it. It was like, you know, I was speaking in the, in the rhetoric of old mentality, and it was mm -hmm. like, when black, you know, successful athletes and black people, the, su white women are success. And that was the clip that <laughs> went viral. <laughs> so so, so, more, they so I say. know they're going to cut this one up and have me saying all type <laughs> of wild stuff. But in, and in that conversation, for years, you know, there's the side of black men, whether once they get successful, they get a, a white woman. Mm -hmm. But then from the perspective of a, a black woman, do you see that? And then again, like, is it, does it, when you see people like myself or anybody mm -hmm. dating outside of our culture, mm -hmm. does, is that, painful and, and how does that make you feel? I am not um, against interracial relationships so I don't think I don't see you and go oh you know what I do see is you know when I feel like there's discrimination against black women mm. by black men and mm. and you can see that from when the, there like is your a, first experience yeah in, in. you can see that when when there's a pattern right um, and, but also there's another, there's another side of it. I remember when my brother, um, went to, um, my brother used to play basketball for the University of Houston and we would go to all the games and, and the white um, women was on them, right? Because, <laughs> they <loved> because <laughs> they thought these guys were going to go to, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm go saying? And so they, so, so it was like, and okay, dark and handsome. Come so on, it's not just, <laughs> so it's not just, it wasn't like they were like going out and saying, we're going to date these white women. It was like the white women were like, we're they going was on them. Yeah, yeah. And they were, they were serious about it too. They were all, all over them all really? the time yeah. yes they'd be sitting in the front row they'd white be like white women love basketball <laughs> players <Jonathan. laughs> so it's it's i think Stereotype. it's a two-way street i don't think it's uh you know i don't think it's uh i don't think they're like oh we're gonna date this black guy because he's black or, right. or we're gonna date him because he's got he's got money he's gonna be successful and he's going to the nba <laughs> the tallest person in the school right? <laughs> um and i don't think you know so in, in the players i don't think they were like oh i'm gonna go get this girl because they're white it was like they were there they were yeah. available hey yeah. and they were they were really on top of that's it was their job that's a very interesting it was their job to get yeah. this guy so yeah. they were available <laughs> so um but um, I think I do think it's hurtful sometimes to black women when um, it's perceived that you're not good enough for mm. someone. You know, I think I, th I think that can, that can be hurtful because I I have been around um, all kinds of races of people and I don't perceive any of them to be better than me. But is this a so conversation I, among I don't, black women? Yes. Yes. A loud. So, no, I don't say loud, but I'm saying that because then I'm like, are you yeah, calling black women loud? Over no, it though. but it's right. like it's a real life. conversation <laughs> right. in the sense of like, and you know, I, I hear it quite quite a bit mm -hmm. because it is it matters on multiple. Like I understand mm -hmm. it, and from I thought I was approaching it from I don't see like when I'm interested in someone, I'm not thinking of what her complexion is mm -hmm. or if she, I honestly don't think that way, but it might be a problem that I don't think that way. Because in that idea of the same way that you are with y your wife, you're like, you're going to marry someone Jewish. That was, that was, that's just embedded within your culture. I never thought that way. I'm like, I'm going to marry somebody fine and rich and <laughs> like, somebody like. Those things are good too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, that's kind of what I desired. No one in my culture was like, you must marry a black woman. Mm -hmm. And even because, even within my own family, there's mixed ethnicities and, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's I have everything from Mexican to 
Jewish to Italian mm -hmm. to, you know, Native American. Like, right. it's all, it, but we are rooted in black. You yeah. know, you look at it like somebody was black in that process. Yeah. But so I never thought like I had to only, you know, mate or Be date with black, with black people. people. So, but I can see when certain things, especially like as a young man, you're not thinking that. Oh, by choosing someone else, you may be making someone else feel bad. Well, the thing is, is if you're growing up and you're seeing stuff, like you're watching, like I grew up watching music videos, yeah. and yeah, all of the black people, yeah. all the black men, they don't have black women in their video, or they have to be really, really look almost like they're white to right. be. In, you know, you start mm. feeling like, well, these people don't like. Mm people like me, you know what I'm saying? So you, it, it's hard to get around that. Or there's that. a few you know, rare, you know, there might be the token dark-skinned mm -hmm. girl in the video. Rarely, Or the but okay. token <laughs> dark-skinned Victoria's Secrets model. Mm -hmm. or the, and, and again, I, like, I've been a part of it. Mm -hmm. I've probably been a part of the problem mm -hmm. for, you know, in that sense mm -hmm. to where, you know, I, and even, you know, whether it's wild and out or like, I try to make it a conscious effort, like, yo, make sure everyone's represented. Mm -hmm. But even the fact that you have to do that well, the, is the, a problem. The, the fact of the matter is, is that, I guess maybe it's an opinion, <laughs> but it's like when you're seeing this everywhere and even your black men are doing it, yeah. you would really love if your own men would really, you know, seem like they at least like you. But to and your point, like, like what your brothers you know what is saying? like, I, I always say, I like who like me. Yeah. Like, so <laughs> if, if if white women like me, then I like you back. <laughs> if, if Latino women yeah. like me, I like you back. And if because of a nature of mm -hmm. like, if I, you know, if black women and specifically darker complected black women, mm -hmm. you know, they all, not all, but most of that community mm -hmm. wants to be liked and loved in the same from their culture as well. Yeah. So you just don't see it. Yeah. And it just makes you feel like, well, who's loving us? Right. And then according to those statistics, the statistics on the dating and nobody site. then, you know, yeah. so it, it, it can be hurtful. Like even talking about it right now, it feels hurtful to right, me, you know? Right. Yeah. So it, it can be hurtful because you're like, who loves me? Right. But I mean, and, but once, I mean, and, and then you play those ideas like, oh, if you love yourself, then you, you, yes, you control you do. your you, frequency. Yes, and you do, you really do right. work on loving yourself, but it's still nice. It's not projected out into society. Yes, exactly. So what, again, so what is that solution? For someone who's going through that experience like you and has dealt with it your entire life, what would you say to the young Shelly Wade out there who's saying, other than love yourself? I feel like, you know, it's up to black women to uplift each other. You know, that's mm. very important to me because mm. we are not being uplifted by other people. Mm. So I feel like we need to uplift each other, first of all. Mm. Wow. Um, and also, I just feel like it's, again, things kind of get better, <laughs> slowly yeah. but surely. Right. There's more representation of Optimism. every, not just black women, but right. people, you know, you everywhere. see more of everyone. And that's a good thing mm. because everyone should feel love and accept it, loved and, and accepted. Yeah, and I think me. conversations like this are mm. important. I mean, yeah. like, even 100%. like, you can tell, you see Jonathan and you feel like <laughs> yeah. he's learned like, a lot. Ooh. He's been in life, <laughs> like, processing. specifically black so here's, women? <laughs> well, like, but, but here's a question, like, so you're a path breaker in your field. Mm -hmm. Right, there aren't a lot of black women in senior positions in radio. So well, who were your role models growing up? Like, who did you, who did you learn from? Well, certainly did I, didn't, um, I didn't, um, uh, I didn't tra blaze any trails as far as black women being on the radio, for sure. But I think but you're still at one of the, you're, I mean, especially for how long you've been doing yeah. it in the places, like I said, like, you, like even reading the stats, I mean, you were the first African American. Um, I was. I was full time the, in. Uh, at, yeah, I on was the one of the biggest radio stations in one of the biggest cities in the world. Like yeah. that's that's a, you are, that's a trailblazing yeah. accomplishment. So that's the I can say that because yeah. uh, there were certainly many black women ahead of me <laughs> in well, the radio of game. But you've but just achieved a prominence. Like you 
are blazing the trail in a way that's really yeah. Certainly at Z100, I was the first African American period, not just woman, to have oh, wow. uh, to have my own radio show. There have been black women on Z100. I mean, black people, and you know, who have been supporting characters yeah. and uh, weekends, but certainly to have a full time show, I was the first, and that happened in 2001. Yeah, and so um, you were one, like you said, the only one in a room mm, of people who didn't often, look like you, yeah, or speak like you, or talk. Or that have was the an culture. experience for me because you know, although. I, I always say I'm very Rhythm Nation because I love all people. I'm a huge <laughs> Shannon Jackson fan. <laughs> right. So I love all people, but um, my experiences in education, in, um, you know, in everything had been mostly around black people. Um, and so it was certainly a different um, experience now coming. You know, we've Did all you had you feel like you were representing all of us? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't feel like I was representing all black people for sure, but... Um, you know, you you have the all black people can say I've had the experience. I was the only black person in this room, Facts. you know, at, at one point or another. I felt like that for a lot of years yeah, right. <laughs> because I was the only one uh, there. Um, but what was the question in mind? Yeah, and I mean, like because I think it was Jonathan's yeah. question. Who, like, like, who, did, who were your oh, role, role models, models looking? Yes, up I to. went off on a tangent. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Oprah for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Prince, I you know grew Prince? up. Yeah, Prince. Really? Is, my favorite artist of all time, you know? And so uh, he was a role model for me musically because I would listen to his music and I'd be like, I, wanna, I, want to, um, I want to affect people with my music the way he affected me. Mm, yeah. He made me, listening to Prince made me want to be a singer. I mean, I would sing around the house all the time and, and um, my brother and sisters would tell me, oh, you have a gorgeous voice. You know, they didn't say those words, but you have a nice voice. Uh, but it wasn't until I became obsessed with Prince, just his music and how it affected me, um, that I said I wanted to sing, you know. Oh, wow. so I, I grew up singing and performing, Bravo. and that was my first uh, dream. Um, and then I got into radio um, when I studied, right. studied it in school. But Prince and Oprah, I would say, were my that's biggest influences. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting that you say Prince, because then it goes back to the conversation what you were saying, because he was definitely like, a strong black voice, mm -hmm. but also an advocate for the melting pot White, of- White, black, uh, Puerto Rican, <laughs> everybody, just <laughs> Exactly, like he was co-mingling. He was, Prince Prince was one of those people, and I think he really had, but I think he I would have been- He wasn't even human. I, no, he wasn't. <laughs> I think I would have been a Rhythm Nation kind of person anyway, because I've mm. always been about love. I remember from a very early age just loving Dr. King so much because mm. he just put out love. Yeah. I also have always loved um, Mr. Rogers. Yeah. Love, <laughs> love, love. Um, I, I think a big reason why I loved Oprah, she was always putting goodness out there, you know? Yeah. And I think I was always gonna be one of those people. Optimism, high frequency. Right? Yeah. But Prince, I think, had a major role in me, you know, just accepting people. And right. that, because I think that's one of the, and I, I love that you guys are doing this. I think it's one of the beautiful things about humans is that we're different. Yeah. And that should be celebrated yeah. instead yeah. of, you know, we shouldn't be like trying to pit ourselves against each other. Who had it worse? Yeah. Yeah. Who had the, who had the worst Olympics. struggle? Yeah, yeah, we yeah the oppression <laughs> Olympics. Yeah, you know, I, I think that the beauty of us is that we're so different. Even being black people, we're so different so from different. each other, right? Yeah. Um, we're different, and that's the beauty of it. That's, yeah. that's, that's our secret sauce, our, right. our differences, you know? So, uh, so in, in obviously being solutions, because that is, that's super profound, but if we try to turn it into an action, mm -hmm. um, what would you encourage this, our, our audience watching, who, who experience hate, who dis experience discrimination, who can relate to the stories that you've told as a black woman? Uh, what's the next step for the next generation? What are, what are the concrete solutions in your opinion? I think the kids of the day, of today have it all right. I think they We just know. gotta listen to them. <laughs> it's, it's the big grown people right. <laughs> who are negatively influencing the kids <laughs> yeah. and teaching them hate. Yeah. I think it's kids yeah. are love. Yeah. They, they say the most know, integrated spaces you know, are sandboxes. Exactly. Oh, that's a great expression. Yeah. Kids are love. I yeah. love children because they're so mm. innocent and loving. Um, and it's not until <laughs> they are confronted with these ideas from human, I mean, from, from adults, yeah. um, they start learning, you know, yeah. hate. So um, true. I mean, it, so it's, it's so, it's funny because I, I get the opportunity to drop my, my daughter off at preschool mm -hmm. and she's super clingy. 
You know what I mean? So I got to spend 30 minutes. <laughs> like, it's not like, here, go. You and, drop off in this. No, it's like, so I got to play in the sandbox. And you know I me, mean? I'm wearing colorful stuff. Like, mm -hmm. so all of the kids are kind of drawn to me. Because one, I'm the only parent still there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see all of these little humans that, you know, there's a, there's a ginger, there's a, yeah. you know, there's a, a Jewish kid, there's a black kid, mm -hmm. and it's like, they all love each other, mm -hmm. they all smile, they all fill with joy, yeah. they all are learning together, and, it, and it's like, it's so hopeful, like, it yeah. bring, it make, like I'm smiling every day that mm -hmm. I get to take my, my daughter to preschool, because you're thinking like, again, when I went to school, it was just black kids, mm -hmm. you know, and we, it was all love, yeah. and then like, yeah. later on in life, I started going, you know, to school with, with other ethnicities, and mm -hmm. I'm like, one of my best friends in elementary school, sixth grade, uh, Jeremy Crass, I'll never forget, shouts out Jeremy, <laughs> first, first time I had ever heard of a bar mitzvah, a, a yarmulke, all this thing, and this was my best friend, like, and yeah. you know, um, that's, that was my introduction to Jewish mm -hmm. culture and heritage, and then, you know, then my mother eventually explained to me, like, oh, we got Jewish people in our family, too. I'm like, word? I'm, I'm closer <laughs> to Jeremy, you know what I mean? Like, all of those things yeah. to where I wanted to just relate to my best friend. Um, I thought, you know, our, at, at my time, I thought our generation had, had evolved, and, you know, the millennials even have taken, taken yeah. it one step further, yeah. and then Gen Z. I feel like doesn't doesn't even care. Like we see Emmett no, here here in care. our conversation, he's like, "What are y'all talking about?" <laughs> like I, I like honestly, yeah, I like my, the people I look up to and all that. So it's it's hopeful. It's high frequency. It's optimistic that we believe yeah. in the future. But uh, I mean, we're also dealing with that's one of the reasons why we're in the investigative research lab because, as we see on that you know screen right there, there's a lot of bigotry and hate and uh, things that still we need to erase. And a, a lot of, I don't want to say newfound, but just resurfaced anti-Semitism. Yeah. How does that make you feel? I know you've discussed it on here before. Is it hurtful to you? How do you feel? Well, you know, look. On, it, a, on a cellular level, for I sure. mean, I worry about, on the one hand, look, Jewish people, like so many of us, have it so great in this country. Mm -hmm. There's so much privilege. There's so much opportunity. And if you wear a kippah or you have a last night cream black, you're not necessarily at least um, ostensibly discriminated against. But look, like it's worrisome when anti-Semitic acts are up more than 500% mm -hmm. wow. in the last decade. And 500%? I know more than, because we track this stuff at ADL. Yeah. That's crazy. There was a 36% spike between 2021 and 2022. This is the highest number we've ever seen. So I worry about them, just their physical security, like going to the supermarket, I mean, all young people today are worried about the mass shooting, right? Yeah. But like, if you're a Jew, there's a reason why we have bulletproof glass in our office, yeah, right? There's you a can't just walk up in here. You can't just show up at the ADL. Yeah. I didn't and realize the glass was there. Yeah, yeah, and it, I mean, because knowing that not only is this place a target, but your community are literal targets yeah. where, I, I mean, that's the importance of these platforms. I, like, yeah. regardless of how many people are watching or streaming and commenting every time we put out a clip it's creating a conversation and it's Which erasing hate and i love it yeah you know i mean yeah. when these clips go up on twitter and you see all of these opposing views <laughs> and how dare jonathan jonathan it's evil talking to evil and like all this <laughs> stuff and it's like but it's it's making you feel yeah. it we're stirring, we stirring you up with this love we stirring you like yep. i always tell them there's a lot of people that are really upset that we are having this conversation for sure weekly haters gonna hate haters gonna hate that's you right know what i mean yeah. and, and <laughs> again the solution is love is coming yeah. together is this discussion and i mean that's why you being here is so important so we thank you for your thank time you. because you know hearing your stories hearing you share it's things that we don't get to hear often you know specifically on these platforms and and, and the ones i do hear that's what i'm saying please black women continue <laughs> to hold me accountable you know what yeah. I mean? Continue to call out the things that hurt you or disappoint you when it comes to figures like myself. I mean, like, cause that's the only way to get to a place where we all can embrace love because yeah. there's all, we're, we're always gonna have things that we don't necessarily agree on. But if we hold it in and it festers, you know, I think social media used correctly, used with compassion and love can produce growth. 
can produce, you know, uh, the ideas of us coming closer together. So accountability is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And if I don't know, you know, my sisters or, you know, m the mothers within our community are hurting or pained by a certain thing, then I won't be able to correct it. Or even it it just live in a space. So I appreciate you. I, I thank you and I value sure, your, you. your perspective and, you know, understanding that, you know, as much as you love yourself, you know, love is a real thing that I, we, I must love you back. Mm -hmm. and, and we must appreciate you on, in the media. We must appreciate mm -hmm. you, you know, in our homes as, as the matriarchs. And we must, in, in order to, in the same way that the Jewish culture has, has preserved, you know, uh, their own and the importance of it. Mm -hmm. You know, we, you know, I always say that the black woman is the foundation of earth. And, and if people don't understand that, and, you know, and just even from the motherland in itself of what Africa has, has produced an entire world, I mean, we, we can accredit that to, you know, the lineage and the DNA that is, lives heavily in, in, in black women. So oh, thank stop you. it, Nick. Thank Keep you. Coming. <laughs> thank Keep you. Coming. I'm jumping off my soapbox now. Uh, but again, I say that because you, you are so important, you know, in your space. Uh, you. And we want to see you continue <laughs> to thrive. And like Jonathan said earlier, I mean, you, you blazing trails. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah. so continue on, and you, you're welcome to come talk about and discuss solutions here anytime. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me. This has really been a wonderful conversation. Yeah. It really has been because I'm used to talking about, you know, I don't know, my music, business, gossip. <laughs> your, yeah, <laughs> my kids. talking about you and your kids yeah. and <laughs> playing, you know, fun songs. Oh, you have songs kids? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a few. Apparently, I can't yeah. remember them all. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice to have a meaningful conversation yeah, like nice. this. It really is. And well, it, in conversation that needs to be had. Well, when you write awesome. your book, come back. I will. And I'll, I'll autograph it. I'll, it'll sit right above Stephen A. Smith. Yeah. <laughs> right above Stephen A. <laughs> there it is. Well, awesome. thank you again. And this has been another important and, as you said, uh, impactful conversation yes. here on Solutions to Hate or Not to Hate. The one and only Shelly Wade. If they want to get uh, follow you or know more about you, how would they do that? Um, I'm on Instagram at the one and only Shelly Wade. Somebody already had the name, so uh, I was like, oh, but you're the how one dare and they? Only. I'm the one and only. The, so the one and only on Instagram, on, on Twitter, at Shelly Wade. Shelly spelled with an E-Y. Funny story. Yeah. My mom, um, when she was pregnant with me, was watching a Shelly Winters movie. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that's why she spelled my name with the E-Y, because that's how Shelly Winters spelled her name. Oh. So Shelly with an E-Y, Shelly Wade on Twitter. Uh, my Facebook page is called All the Rage with Shelly. Wade and I am going to soon launch a new Odyssey podcast called nice. The Goodness Factor ah, with Shelly Wade. There it the is. Goodness Factor with Shelly Wade. So be on the lookout for that and download it because we're just going to be shining the spotlight on uh, people out here doing good things because we are inundated it. with the bad news, news all the time, right? Yeah. So you guys should come on my podcast. That's yeah, how we, we will. Anytime. <laughs> anytime. There is um, no news like yeah. good news, as Gary Gnu would say. <laughs> Uh, but you know what? Thank you again. And this has been such a, uh, a healing and like learning experience for me as well. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate the growth uh, from this conversation. And if you have as well, make sure you like and subscribe and tune in until next time. This is Solutions with Nick Cannon and Jonathan Greenblatt. Holla.